Good evening. Um, uh, it's very good to see you this evening. It's very kind of you to come out and listen to what I'm going to say. Um, this is billed as an introduction to contemporary Asian art, which if that was really the subject of the talk, it would be very ambitious. I'm not really going to give you a survey of contemporary Asian art. It would be impossible. Um, what I am going to do is just um, speak quite informally, really, um, about some ideas which might have a bearing on uh, the interpretation of contemporary Asian art. And, and my, my kind of focus is mainly aesthetic. And I've got quite a lot to get through, so if I rush a little bit, just say, whoa, slow down and stop me. There'll be some time for some questions afterwards. And we look at, we've got quite a few images to look at. There's also a short film um, which, uh, which we can look at as well. And the title is An Introduction to Contemporary Asian Art or <laughs> What Makes Today's Asian Art So Different, So Appealing. Those of you who know Richard Hamilton's work will know where that quotation comes from. So, an introduction to contemporary Asian art. No, I didn't bring the wrong <laughs> lecture. I'm going to start with a painting, a European painting from the mid-15th century. Um, don't worry, we'll get there. This is by Masaccio. It's the Trinity. It's a fresco painting, which is still pretty much in situ, not in exactly the same place as it was originally cited, but it's in the same uh, church in Florence, the Santa Maria Novella. Uh, uh, as I say, it's a fresco painting, which means it's water-based pigments which were painted onto wet plaster. Um, the actual painting is probably a little bit bigger than that. Um, and I think originally would have been, uh, this part would have been down here around about floor level. So you would have actually been looking up at, at the images as depicted. And um, if you want a quick kind of decoding of the iconography, you have the crucified Christ behind him. Very, very rare for European painting is an image of God the Father. Uh, you can just about see it. There's a white blob, blob just above Christ's head. That's uh, a dove, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, these are the donors, people who paid for the thing. Um, got the Virgin Mary here and and St. John, which is a standard format for crucifixions. And the skeleton of Adam, the first man, and a, um, an inscription, which is a memento mori, reminding us all of our eventual death. The style of the architecture is neoclassical, which is very much in keeping with the early stages of the Renaissance, early undecorated um, neoclassical architecture. Um, without laboring this, I could go on and on and on. Uh, but what's key to this painting, it's the first painting in um, the Western painterly tradition to use perspective, perspective geometry, in a systematic manner. Almost certainly there was um, perspective geometry in antiquity, but in the early Renaissance, this is the first painting uh, to use that. And Masaccio worked very closely with the architect Brunelleschi, uh, who was responsible for um, uh, the cathedral in, uh, in Florence, the, the one with the dome. Now, why am I looking at this? Well, perhaps it represents two things. One's the obvious thing is that, you know, if you're Catholic, uh, you would understand this very readily. It represents the supposed mystery of the Trinity. It has God, the Father, the crucified Christ, and the, um, as I say, Holy Spirit represented by the dove. But I'd also like to argue, and I don't think anybody else has really argued this, but it's a doubling of the sacrament of the Eucharist. Now, some of you may already know what that means, but if you don't, I'll explain. In the early 15th century, the Eucharist, which is a sacrament of the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, but in a slightly different manner, 
uh, was a well-established aspect of, of, of uh, Catholic Church ritual. And there are a number of sacraments, including baptism and last rites, but one of them is the Eucharist. And the sacrament of the Eucharist is when you go to church and you take communion. And what happens is, is that, uh, you probably know this, but the priest holds up bread and wine and speaks words over it and transubstantiates the wine and the bread, wine and wafers of bread, through the saying of the liturgy into the actual body and blood of Christ. That's the mystery of the Eucharist. The bread and the wine, as we'll see in a moment, do not change their outward form. Because the bread and wine are understood to change into the actual body and blood of Christ, then when they are consumed by the congregation, who, uh, if they've, um, uh, at, at the communion, when they consume these things, they um, become one with Christ. There's a communion with God. The key issue about transubstantiation is it's not symbolic. The form of the wine and the bread do not change. Their appearances do not alter. Nevertheless, there is a belief, a faith, that in speaking words over them, that the priesthood have changed the bread and the wine into the very flesh and blood of Christ. They are not an allegory or symbol or simply a reminder of a crucified Christ, but literally his body present at that moment. And as such, they are also a reenactment of a similar act which takes place at the Last Supper, where if you remember, and you've obviously seen the painting by uh, Leonardo da Vinci, where you know, God, oh, Christ upholds bread and wine and says, partake of my body, the eve before the um, on the night before the crucifixion. Why is this important? Well, one thing I would argue here is that when Brunelleschi and Masaccio made this painting, when they brought together perspective geometry and they brought it together with this representation of the Trinity, they were trying to go beyond the mere representational conventions of painting. That painting was, in a sense, a, 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 a secondary presentation of something absent. I think they were trying to go beyond that. I suspect that one of the things that they were doing was transubstantiating, attempting to transubstantiate the base materials of painting, the pigment and the plaster, without any ostensible change to their appearance into the very body and blood of God. This is not simply a pictorial memento or allegorical reminder of the Christian sacrifice, but a performative, an acting out of God's presence, which once consumed through the eyes leads the viewer into communion. The painting is a kind of performative doubling of the Eucharistic um, sacrament. This is not simply God somewhere else and a painting representing God, but it is painting and God together. It is a conjunction of the artwork as signifier and signified. And as such is to be taken as a perfect matching, I think, of form and content that is beautiful, in which we are to take visual pleasure. Jumping ahead a little to 1917. This is a work by Marcel Duchamp. Uh, known as Fountain, or rather it isn't. This is a facsimile which was made uh, in the 1960s. Um, the original, if there is an original, Fountain, which 
may or may not have been displayed at the Society of Independent Artists in New York in 1917, was lost. It was photographed at the time, but the original fountain was lost. And um, during the 1950s and 1960s, a number of facsimiles were produced um, simply to meet the demands of museums and collectors for some kind of uh, symbol or remembrance of this extremely important modernist artwork. I don't want to digress too much, but what, one of the things which makes this work interesting, this particular version, is that this is not a urinal. This is a sculpture of a urinal made by Italian craftsmen. And if you go to Tate Modern in London, they have one. There's a series of about 20 or so. Uh, Duchamp kept a couple. And uh, there's one in, 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 in Tate Modern. And it's actually not a urinal, as I say. It's a, it's a kind of sculpture. And this was largely discovered when the Tate was uh, restoring the object when they acquired it and found that one of the flanges on the side had actually broken off and had been stuck back on and crudely restored. And when they um, tried to restore it again, they discovered that this wasn't a, um, a piece of industrial manufacture, which kind of deepens the, the joke about this work. Well, how does this operate? Well, it's in, in a sense, it's an everyday object, a urinal, something that you could arguably just go and buy um, in a plumber's shop, which is pretty much what Duchamp did in 1917. He buys an object, and then that object is taken out of its usual setting and purpose, and it's represented for contemplation as a work of art. The issue about that is that when we, when we look at it, what is it? Is it a urinal? Is it a work of art? Which one is it? Arguably, its significance as an artwork is undecidable. It's possible to interpret the ready-made both as a work of art and as an everyday object. Work of art everyday object. But as such, it is neither wholly a work of art nor wholly an everyday object. Hence its undecidability. Does this sound a little familiar? A ceramic urinal, in principle, even if not in practice, is Without any significant alteration, only this signature, R. Mutt, 1917, on the side, without any significant alteration, upheld as a work of art. It has, in effect, been transubstantiated. Its appearance has not really been altered. It's still a urinal. And yet its significance has been altered. What I would like to argue here that is that Duchamp is effectively, and he may not have been entirely conscious of this, but he is effectively deconstructing the art world, that's to say the set of conditions which surround the production uh, of the Trinity. Now just to expand on that, I'm going to use the term Trinity world. Some of you may be familiar with the notion of art worlds in a philosophical sense. In a philosophical sense, an art world is the whole set of conditions which surrounds uh, the production or construction and display of artworks. If we think about Trinity world, and if particularly if we think about Trinity as some kind of doubling of the Eucharist, then this involves a set of conditions. First we have an interaction between the artist as celebrant, artist as priest, the art object as a consecrated host, that is to say, bread and wine, a liturgical set of conventions 
and rituals surrounding the production, presentation, and reception of art. That is to say, um, a number of things which we take as norms or givens around what the way we should look at, the way we should receive or talk about art. A place of worship, like this. A gallery, a museum, which is a substitute or a surrogate for a church, in which the artwork is held up to view. And a lay congregation of art worshippers initiated in a more or less rigorous way into the workings of the art world. And this not only works for the Eucharist and the work of art, but it's exactly what we're doing right now. I'm the speaker as celebrant. You're the laity. Here's the church. This is what I'm transubstantiating. What Duchamp does is he reveals the conditions of the artwork, the European artwork. He reveals that the presence of the artwork as art is a performative construct. It is a performative act. The artwork has no essence or foundation. It does not exist other than through this performance, through this act of transubstantiation, which requires a particular set of conditions involving, as we've just been saying, a particular place, a particular audience, a particular um, set of initiates, and objects. He deconstructs, in effect, the conditions of the European artwork. And if you wish to reflect on this, he may have deconstructed it, but it doesn't mean to say that he negated it or got rid of it, because this is precisely the way that art still works. It has its spaces. It has its initiates, it has its objects, etc. Some of you might have seen the show downstairs. If you haven't, you should go and see it. Those of you who have seen the show will know that, that that's not simply a plinth or a box in the show. It's an, actually an artwork. It's a digitally produced set of surfaces which are digital repre photographic representations of an actual plinth according to the title of the work um, in a gallery in Lahore. In many ways, Rashid Rana's work is hugely indebted, and he wouldn't mind me saying so, I'm sure, to Duchamp. He plays the Duchampian game like pretty much every artist today, contemporary artist today. There is a conscious irony, a knowing irony, which continues to deconstruct the conditions of the production and display of the artwork. And Rashid Rana's work is no different to that. It's part of what he assimilates from the wider internationalized contemporary art world. These are Duchampian objects with their knowing observers with their glass of wine in hand, perhaps a slice of bread tucked into their back pocket, with their lay audience in a cathedral-like space worshipping at the feet of these transubstantiated objects. Indeed, if you've been to the mezzanine, there are some artworks there by Rana which cite or quote paintings, some very famous paintings in Tate Modern, which are currently housed in Tate Modern by Mark Rothko, which were originally intended uh, for the Four Seasons restaurant 
in New York, but were rejected because they were a little bit, uh, a little bit miserable. And Rana quotes these, but they're part of a flesh and blood series. They make use of images of flesh and blood. I doubt, having spoken to him, that Rashid self-consciously appropriated any kind of Eucharistic method here. But the artist's intentions are not ruling in these things. And the traces of um, the kind of operative structures of the performance of art tend to be quite um, persistent despite the intentions of artists. And we certainly have arguably a trace of a kind of Eucharistic way of working here. Almost, in this case, in reverse. I guess the point I'm making here is that if we're interpreting Rashid's work, one possible way of interpreting his work aesthetically is to draw attention to its relationship to a longer and nowadays deconstructed tradition of performativity, Eucharistic performativity in Western art. Now I could actually stand here for probably half a day going exhaustively through all sorts of permutations around the way that we might interpret works of art, Western works of art, and how that might apply to uh, works of non-Western contemporary art. But I'm not going to do that because we haven't got the time. What I am going to do, given that we've talked about Duchamp, is perhaps draw our attention to another uh, significant perspective on contemporary art, which was probably uh, more strongly recognized maybe 10, 20 years ago, but I, I guess it uh, still gets its airing in various ways. Um, certainly a couple of exhibitions in London recently that have kind of drawn attention back to this. But it's the notion of the postmodern sublime. Duchamp is arguably prototypically postmodernist insofar as he can be understood to deconstruct the conditions of Western art making. That's to say he demonstrates the uncertainty of the process, that it is not essential but performative, that it gives rise or constructs the notion of art rather than simply reflects an essence. There is always, and this comes from the writings of uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, his argument is that the postmodern artwork is a sublime artwork. That's to say there is a slippage between the artwork as a signifier, as a signifying object, and its signified meaning, what it refers to, what it means, including its presence as art very much at the heart, obviously, of Duchamp's work. What is the sublime? Lyotard refers back, particularly to the, the writings of the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, but of course Kant derives his version of the sublime from mainly British writers, including um, uh, the uh, Anglo-Irish writer Burke in the 18th century. Essentially, the sublime is this. There is a slippage between what you see and the meaning. So let me give you a kind of a more obvious example. You look up at the night sky on a clear night, and you see a multitude of stars. And there is an intimation that you begin, you, you are able to reason a sense of the illimitability or the infinity of space. However, what you see is only a fragment of what you conceptualize. There is a slippage between what you perceive and what you can understand. What you understand is illimitable. What you see is limited. The response to that, if you recognize that slippage, argues Kant and Burke and Lyotard, the response to that in terms of feeling is initially in terms of feelings of pain. You feel pain at not being able to match up the thing you see with the thing that you think. 
You cannot match these two together, and it offends your sense of rational order. However, soon after that, pain, uh, that pain gives way to pleasure, feelings of pleasure. And the pleasure is there really at one's ability to exceed the limitations of perception by grasping the significance of the illimitable meaning um, that is being signified. In this case, the artwork as art. And the ability of the artwork to engender or give rise to aesthetic feeling, which is not conceptual. It is also an acting out, says Kant in particular, of the human capacity to reason beyond the inherent uncertainties of signified meaning. There is moral order in this. The Kantian sublime imputes a moral dimension to aesthetic feeling. Lyotard resurrects this in the late 1970s and 1980s in response to postmodernist art um, in order to kind of fill a moral gap. He makes this claim that postmodernist art, challenging postmodernist art, is sublime. That sublimity could be taken to usher in um, a kind of endless uh, irrationality, but he wants to bring back in the possibility of art fulfilling some kind of moral function. And this is how he implies it. Now, we could sit here all day arguing as to whether Kant is right, whether Lyotard's right. I happen to think they're not right, but it's perhaps beyond the limits of this lecture. But this idea has been a very strong one in relation to the art of our time, that that, in a moral aesthetic sense, that is how the art of our time operates. This is perhaps how we should see this, according to that way of looking at things. There is no clear match between what you see and what you think. It is not at all clear, either in, in these terms, what you might feel. But that's perhaps another story. In any case, there's a slippage. And arguably, this work is, in a certain sense, conceptually anyway, sublime. We might even pursue this argument in relation to Rashid's work. I particularly like this, I hope some of you have seen this, but this um, work where you can look at it from differing perspectives, and there's a kind of parallax. You know the term parallax? That when you shift your position, you get a kind of different view of an object, or an object takes on differing significance. Well, in this work, and it's difficult to see here, but we, we can only really pick up the signified image according to our position in relation to the work. And what we can see at a distance is a cityscape, a modern cityscape, maybe Shanghai or New York or, or somewhere like that. Now we'll come back to this, but when you get closer to this work, and a lot of Rashid's work is like this, that bigger image is made up of a whole series of smaller representations which can be um, uh, perceived in themselves. So you can shift your perspectives both in spatially and in terms of proximity. Now, arguably, this is very much in keeping with the postmodernist artwork in terms of a co constant shifting of perspectives and a slippage between what you might see here and what uh, might be signified there. It's a, an illimitable artwork. There is a sense of vastness to this in terms of what is signified, even though the perceptual form itself is limited. Just to sum up then, maybe what we can see in relation to Rashid's work are two very important elements of westernized contemporary art. One is a deconstruction of um, a long-standing performative um, way of making and showing art in westernized context. And the other is an associated aesthetic of the sublime, which has a provenance, as I say, in relation to writing around postmodernism. So one way we can look at Rashid's work is simply to co-opt it to an existing westernized postmodernism. <coughs> 
However, the two things I want to bring to bear here, and we're shifting our ground yet again, but one is some things that I know about China, and then we're going to come back to a little bit of subcontinent Asia. The, the history of literature around art and aesthetics in China is vast and complicated and, uh, and, and uh, has persisted over a, um, a huge um, um, uh, history. However, I'm going to pick one thing out, and it's this particular work, Wenxin Diaoling, The Literary Mind and the Carving of Dragons, which was written by someone called Liu Xie in the 6th century of the Christian era. Now, I'm not planning to go through the whole work, but I just want to pick out two terms. One of the key issues um, that Liu points to is the notion of sway or manifest and yin, latent meaning. Now, manifest meaning in terms of the artwork is not, doesn't mean superficial in this context. It's simply what strikes you first. It's what has an immediate impact on you as an observer. It is not to be belittled because of that. There, is no, there, there isn't necessarily a hierarchy, a structural hierarchy here between superficial and deeper meaning. Nevertheless, latent meaning looks towards the notion of a, lay, a layering of meaning which lies beyond the text or, and certainly lies beyond the manifest or immediate impact of the work. It is meaning or feeling that unfolds slowly over time, perhaps intermittently through repeated um, engagements with the artwork. It is about the continual revelation of layers of greater depth of meaning. It is also arguably about illimitable transformation. I'm going to jump again. I'm jumping all over the place with this. Song Tao, B6. B6 is not a pencil in this case. B6 is a, an electronic musician from Shanghai. This is Song Tao. This is B6. Sitting in the cafe of the Museum of Contemporary Art sometime in 2007. Why am I bringing them up? Well, this is supposed to be a lecture about Asian art, so here we are. Song Tao is a photographer, filmmaker. He doesn't always work with B6. He sometimes works with another artist called Ji Wei Yu. He also works on his own. But when he's working with B6, they produce videos together with soundtracks. And uh, we're just going to look in a moment, when I give the word, to... Um, a video by Songtown B6 called, in English, Yard, which I think was made in 2006. And this is just a, well, well, there's a reason for this, we'll come back to it. This is just off the website of Shang Art, the gallery that represents um, Songtao's work. And as you can see, it's a set of stills from this, this video laid out, as we shall see, a little bit like a, a Chinese painting scroll. Skills from the work. We'll actually have a look at the video in a moment. But before we do, I just want to draw your attention to how it was staged. It was staged once, to my knowledge. Um, what we're going to see is simply the video. But the actual staging in uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in, I think, about 2007, I think it was 2007, was in a box. Now, this is a little bit complicated. Imagine a corridor, and on one side of the corridor here, there is a transparent projection screen, and on the other side of the corridor is a mirror. The way the work was shown is that the, the, the video was projected onto this screen in reverse, or rather the right way around, and then it goes into reverse on the other side, and then gets mirrored. The viewer walks into the box through a curtain and is able to see the video both in reflection and 
to a certain extent through the transparent projection. There is a sense of immersion in the video and once one is inside, there's also the soundtrack to contemporary. So when we're going to watch, could we see this video now? What we're going to watch now, try and imagine that you're seeing this within that set of viewing conditions. Thank you. 
Thanks. Can we go back to the slides? Thank you. Okay, so you've got to imagine that video being played and the music being played within that box. So what's the aesthetic response? Well, you may have just had an aesthetic response to that. You may have had some feelings about it. I can tell you what my feelings were when I first saw it under those conditions, very immersive conditions. Uh, this is a film about, in it, which relates to, in a certain sense, Shanghai, or what it li it's like to live within a huge, illimitable, monstrous city like Shanghai. And certainly, in, um, from Western perspectives, where we're often used to representations of those Chinese monster cities as being um, sublime in the Western sense, a certain pain at not being able to grasp the vastness of the city. This video didn't seem to involve any feelings of pain, and yet was, as I saw it, about what might otherwise have been thought of as a sublime subject. Jumping again. This is a painter, uh, Zhang, active in the 12th century, painted a very famous painting. Life along the river on the eve of the Qingming Festival. The Qingming Festival is the grave sweeping festival in China. And this is in a genre known as the everyday life genre. You may know this painting. Certainly if you're from China, you're going to know this one. It's a scroll. That's to say it, it follows a typical Chinese painting form. And it involves, you can't see it very well, but it involves a movement through a landscape. So you can follow it from this end. You're moving through a landscape, along a river, and eventually into a town where there's huge detail of what's going on. This painting is used by historians who, who use it as a reference work to uh, try to understand what urban life in China was like in the 12th century. But like a lot of these kind of paintings, there is an unfolding over time. You don't actually see the whole painting at once, or that's not the way it was meant to be looked at. It was meant to be held as a scroll and unfolded piece by piece. And in a sense, you are traveling through this space, and you are moving in and out of detail from the general, the open landscape, into some really significant detail, some of which you can't see it very well here, some of which, it, which is inside the architecture. Uh, you can see people doing various things inside the buildings. Sound familiar? What was the film we just looked at like? Starts off on the edges of the city, green space, follows a river, moves in, eventually moves inside. There's a nice little shot when they get inside where Song Tao just has a quick look outside to make sure he's in Shanghai and then gets back to the dancing. But it follows, I think, arguably a similar kind of everyday format to this Chinese art. Now, I, I did a a presentation like this in Shanghai and Song Town B6 were there and they hadn't thought of that, but they liked the idea. <laughs> but I think it does follow that kind of format. More importantly, I think, for our discussion, the aesthetic feeling that one has with this is does not necessarily follow the expectations of the Kantian or Western sublime. It may be an irrational or sublime artwork in a certain sense, but I think what's going on here perhaps or could be interpreted more closely according to uh, more traditional uh, Asian ways of thinking about aesthetic experience. But not only this work, which you'd expect to read in that way, but I would argue this very much more contemporary work by Song Tao and B6. Of course, you know, you can frame anything any way you like. You can take it with a pinch of salt. But the film does enfold, more or less, in the way that the painting does. Just to finish up, I'll take us back in a little bit of a circle. A similar aesthetic uh, way of conceiving things relates to classical Indian poetics. In classical Indian poetics, we have the notion of divani, or resonance, which is conditional upon poetry. No poem can be a poem unless it has this 
quality. It's a semantic inexhaustibility, a, a constant openness to reinterpretation. A work which resonates in the mind of the reader or viewer indefinitely, without limit. And this invokes, or is understood to invoke, Brasa's emotions or feelings savored through aesthetic experience. If you actually look at the history of Western aesthetics, one thing you might find there, on the whole, not completely, but on the whole, is actually quite a limitation around the notion of what aesthetic feeling can be. Beauty is generally seen as pleasurable. The sublime involves pain and pleasure. Beyond that, there isn't much of a discussion of the nuances of feeling or the, or the um, wider range of the possibilities of feeling that an individual might have. Conceptually, it's pretty limited. In the Asian or Eastern tradition, quite different. We have a certain sense of sublimity, but it leads to a much more nuanced, unfolding, shifting, um, more detailed view of the possibilities of how we may feel in relation to a work which knows no end. Back to Rashid. When he had his opening, I mentioned this work to him and I drew his attention and said, were you thinking about Indian poetics when you made this work? And he said no. But I think this has elements of Indian poetics in it. It has, or if we even go back to the Chinese version of this, it has a manifest um, aspect to it. Here's a, an image which looks a little bit like a Gerhard Richter of a building, which I think is in Lahore. Um, which is actually not historical. It's, it's, a, it's a recent image which uh, Rana took or had taken for it. But when we get close, and those of you who've been into the exhibition will know that it's composed of a series of images, photographs that were taken of the same subject over, I think, a day um, during varying light conditions. This work, if you spend time with it, is unfolding. It is nuanced. It has latent and manifest significance, which seems to be much closer to those um, Asian views of aesthetics than perhaps the kind of aesthetics that I was introducing earlier on. Not to let the Europeans off the hook, we find something similar during the 18th century philosophers, the two Schlegels and Novalis, talk about something similar. So to conclude, what is it that makes contemporary Asian art, or today's Asian art, so special, so appealing? Well, one of the things, I think, is the complex openness, or the openness of that work to complex aesthetic interpretation. I think it is open to a whole range of differing perspectives on how we might render that work in aesthetic terms. And it is that very perspectivism, its openness to these differing perspectives, the parallaxes involved in that, that are hugely characteristic, I think, of contemporary Asian art now. Thank you very much. I've gone on a bit, but I think I've got a few minutes for questions, if anybody. Yeah. Anybody like to ask me a question? Like, where can I get B6s and CDs from? Or? No, I, I think that's actually a very good question. I think all of this is predicated on the openness of the viewer to these possible perspectives. I mean, one thing I'm arguing here is that the artworks themselves, I think quite reasonably, can be interpreted in this way. I don't think we have to strain too much to, to open 
these artworks up to these differing perspectives. But of course, you're right. If you don't have a, a, a knowledge, let's say, of European aesthetics and Asian aesthetics, then that's just a blank to you. But that implies something about the contemporary viewer as well. You know, the contemporary viewer is like the contemporary artist. They're not necessarily as immured within their cultural space as they might have been 100 years ago. Having said that, you know, I think all the way through this, I've said that when I spoke to the artist, and said, oh, by the way, I think you can do this. They don't always recognize that. You know, it's not a given that everybody is going to be perfectly open to all of these possibilities. It's always dependent on what you've experienced and what you've read. And there are always practical limitations around that that we can't avoid. Any other questions? Stunned into silence. Well, thank you very much for coming along and indulging me. And I hope that was entertaining, if nothing else. So uh, thank you very much and good night. <laughs>